And what I'll talk about is the de-biased lasso. So um, what uh, we've seen a lot nowadays is uh, algorithms for high dimensional problems. And then you try to prove uh, theoretical properties of these algorithms. This is about uh, inference and a more or less classical inference in the sense of trying to find um, confidence intervals and tests. And I'll just consider a very simple case. Um, so, and the aim will be to look at uh, asymptotic normality of estimators in high dimensions. And once you have asymptotic normality, you can build your confidence intervals and tests. <coughs> okay? So, um, let's start on the whiteboard. Uh, we have, uh, like uh, on Tuesday, but don't worry, I'm not going to use the results there, a response variable X, a Y in N dimensions and the design matrix X of dimensions N times P and the linear model. So Y equals X beta plus error. This is the linear model, right? Uh, the factor beta is an unknown. And I'm going to assume for simplicity that the noise, that's the noise, is standard Gaussian. Okay, now I'm going to construct a um, confident interval for a parameter of interest, a one-dimensional parameter. You can extend that to higher dimensions. And if you have high, very high dimensions, you might use some multiple testing technique. But let's consider a one-dimensional parameter of interest. And let's say that the parameter of interest is the first component of the vector beta. Could be also any other component, so without the loss of generality. Or it could be multiple components, but for the moment, or for today, we assume that we're interested in estimating the first component. Beta 1. Okay, now, um, to, to place it in a further context, let's say that the design is random and that the rows of the matrix X are Gaussian. Uh, let the rows of X be IID copies of some vector X maybe a little bit different notation. And this x is, say, mean zero and some covariance matrix sigma. Okay, now just go back, back, back to the basics. Suppose you can just do least squares. Then we know what to do, right? Uh, case one, the number of parameters is p. Suppose P is less than N, or less than or equal, maybe. But let's say P is fixed, and the rank uh, of X is P. Yeah? Then you can do these squares, that's like this. X transpose X inverse X transpose Y. These squares estimator, right? And then you have uh, its distribution, so beta hat zero. So given x, say, is then normal zero x transpose x inverse. Okay? And okay, we're interested just in the first component. So. Um, if this is the first component, it's just the first, <coughs> it's just the, the, the entry of this matrix in the top mm, left corner. Huh? So we have that square root n, the least squares estimator of the first component minus the true one converges in distribution to normal zero 
theta 1, 1. Where that's just the inverse of that matrix, so uh, where theta is sigma inverse, and this is just the upper left corner, okay? Assuming that exists. Yeah, so the rank of x is p, so that should exist. I think I, I assume it or, or whatever, yeah, exists. Yeah? Do you need to normalize here also in, the, in this line? Maybe, maybe. Normalization is needed. No, no, so I, if you write... Um, oh, the sigma is, uh, uh, sig sigma is normalized, yeah? So okay. this is the estimate of this, so this is already normalized, yeah. Yeah. yeah so sigma hat converges to sigma and its inverse uh, should converge too, I think, if p is fixed. Yeah? So, anyway. Now, um, so we want to mimic that in high dimensions. P much larger than N. Now my main idea of this talk will be, what is the asymptotic, so this is the asymptotic variance. Right? You call this the asymptotic variance. Um, what is the efficient asymptotic variance of the estimator of the first component in the linear model? Well, we have the camera lower bound, and maybe you know it, maybe you do not know it. But in, in low dimensions, let me put it here, uh, thick sigma 1, 1 um, is the kramer rao lower bound. If what? If you have no assumptions on the parameters, of course. So say you know that the parameters are in some space. If you have no assumptions, the parameter is the whole space. And then this is the kramer rao lower bound. Yeah? Or you just know the Markov, what is it called? M for best linear unbiased estimators, you cannot Gauss. do better than that. Gauss Markov. <laughs> it's far away from me. So, um, you might want to mimic this and just show that also in higher dimensions you get uh, some estimate, you can construct some estimator which has this asymptotic variance. And what I want to show in this talk is sort of um, maybe also start a discussion and show that no, in high dimensions, in high dimensions we assume sparsity, so we don't have, we assume something about the parameter. And so in high dimensions it's not the whole parameter space, it's assuming that some sparsity, like that some of the coefficients of the parameter beta are zero. So I want to show you that in high dimensions, indeed, this is not the kramer rao lower bound. It's actually a little bit larger. It can be larger, uh, just by examples. And that uh, means that uh, it's, it's good news. So it's... Uh, you don't have to be so pessimistic, but you also have to be careful. If you construct an estimator which has this asymptotic variance, then you're not supposed to cry out and say it's, it's efficient. You have to be careful there. So this is in the literature, you see that often that people say it's efficient, but then it's actually not. Okay, just to get an idea about what can we do in high dimensions, uh, we say, okay, we first estimate uh, the parameter. So that's the p-dimensional vector, and I take, for instance, the lasso, and I estimate it like that. And then I take a one-step newton refson estimator which is like this. Oh, I have to, I forget to write something. Assume. So let's just, for, to get into it, let's assume that the covariance matrix is known. Then we take the estimator like this. Like this. And what's this? 
this is the first column or row, whatever, of theta. Theta is the precision matrix, it's the inverse of the covariance matrix. And then this one is asymptotically normal under some conditions. Let me put them down. So it's really easy, easy work now. Let me put the lemma. Suppose you have some rate of convergence for your initial estimator in L1 norm, small order 1 over square root log P, then square root N divided by... Okay, I normalize. I should really normalize because everything... That's important. I keep on forgetting it myself, but everything depends on the sample size. So everything changes with sample size. If not, um, I'll have to say that explicitly. So I can't really write this because the limit depends on still on, the s on n. So I have to normalize. Okay. <coughs> okay. Goes to in distribution normal zero one. Question? No? So let's prove this. Prove. <coughs> okay, so you have beta 1 minus beta 1, 0 equals the, the definition. It's there. Beta 1 hat plus theta 1 transpose x transpose and this y is equal to the noise plus something, eh? so it's epsilon minus x beta hat minus beta zero divided by n. So I put the beta hats mm -hmm. together. Um, you can write it as, well, this is the, the unit vector, the first unit vector transpose times the whole vector. So I can write it as E1, the first unit vector. And here you get minus theta 1 transpose x transpose x, that's sigma hat if you divide by n. And then you get beta hat minus beta 0. And so this is transpose, transpose, transpose here. This transpose that is the first element, and then this is just that times that. And then there's a conditionally on x linear term. Okay, now let's look at this part. This part is asymptotically, you can forget about it. So um, you can write it as uh, um, sigma minus sigma hat theta 1 transpose. Yeah, so sigma times theta 1, well, theta is the inverse, so sigma times theta 1 is the first unit vector. Yeah? And then, um, let's see if I can do it. In absolute value, you just do the dual norm inequality. Theta 1. The sup norm and here the L1 norm. Okay, and then maybe I should write it, but there's no much space. You know that this is small enough. Eh? Maybe write it here. That's order, that's by assumption order 1 over square root of log p. And here you have 
the maximum of uh, p, uh, well, at least sub exponential random variables, and then taking the average. And then, yeah, you know, the maximum of those things is you always of order log p over n. So the whole thing is of small order square root of n, so you in the asymptotics you can forget about it. So this term you, d you can forget about. It asymptotically vanishes. And then this term, that's the final argument. You go up here. What about that term? So it's um, distributed given x. So conditionally on, conditionally on x, the distribution of that thing is of the that term given x is just normal zero, and then the covariance is theta one transpose sigma hat theta one. Uh, I think I have to divide by n, right? Not so sure. And then sigma hat converges to sigma, and you know that sigma one transpose sigma, uh, theta one transpose sigma theta one, is theta one transpose um, the first unit vector, which is theta one one. Yeah, so this, this term goes to um, theta one one. So that's the, the idea. Okay. Okay. Now this is a, a very simple uh, result. If you look in the literature, for instance, in particular papers by uh, Montanari, they, he, he proves um, a result like this with a, not this condition, but the usual condition. So um, the usual sparsity condition that the sparsity um, is of small order n divided by log p. Let me write it here. Uh, uh, maybe you, you remember, or maybe you were there on on Tuesday. Usual sparsity condition. Um, S is small order n divided by log p, where S is the uh, the S is the, sometimes written like this, just the number of non-zero elements of the vector beta. Okay, so in the literature you can find results which say, okay, if I have only this condition and some technical conditions, I don't assume this, then I can prove this. So the point is now, okay, okay so it's, it's nice that you can prove that you don't need any conditions on the sparsity of the of the precision matrix, it's all very nice, but uh, the estimator can be inefficient. Okay, so there is uh, some some discussion about that. Okay, this inefficiency is what I want to show, and just a final remark. Uh, remark. What is this first? Uh, column of the precision matrix, you can write it as <coughs> 1 here minus gamma 2 minus gamma p divided by uh, the residual sum of squares if you project the first vector on all the others. Okay, so where um, gamma zero is the projection, so the coefficients of the projections are min x one minus x minus one c squared. Yeah, so this is a theoretical projection. You project the first vector on all the others. These are its coefficients. This is the residual sum of squares. I put the square here. And these coefficients, they occur as the first row. 
uh, after normalization. Uh, so theta 1, 1. Theta 1, 1 is here. So it's x, the, the inverse of these residuals. And maybe you remember this. This is not a new result, but just to remember. Um, here's a gamma. Gamma 0 squared. And then the inverse of that, 1 over. Yeah, so the, if you, the projection, if the projection is very small, you have, you're, you're left over with a lot, and then you're happy because then the asymptotic variance is small. Yeah, if this variable has nothing to do with all the others, then this will be a very large, large. Uh, hmm. la 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 la. If this, the, uh, so, yeah, if this has nothing to do with the others, this will be a small number. Okay, and also let me just before going to the slides, just to normalize, let's assume from now on that on the diagonal there are ones of this matrix. Maybe less than or equal to one, but let's say just equal to one, just to normalize. Okay? Okay, now we, need, we go to the slides. Okay, so there's the linear model. Uh, the unknown coefficients and the noise, and the high dimensional case and the parameter of interest, okay? All right. Assume Gaussianity, so the, the, the noise is Gaussian, the covariables X are Gaussian, and uh, so everything is Gaussian. So you just have a P plus one dimensional Gaussian vector. Conditional uh, mean of Y given X is this linear function in the Gaussian case, of course. And then the covariance matrix of the axis, we assume it has an inverse. We normalize that the elements in this matrix are bounded. I'm doing asymptotics, so I do some normalization. Say the diagonal is just all ones. An important assumption, which I assume throughout, is that the minimal eigenvalue of this matrix stays away from zero. Okay? Here's the lasso. That could be a good candidate for the initial estimator here. All right. And this is the d bias lasso, which I've written on the board. It's now gone. Mm -hmm. So I just do a one-step newton refson uh, So one step in the... This is the derivative uh, of the of the loss function, the derivative of the function you're trying to minimize, and this is its inverse, so the Hessian, and you take the inverse of the Hessian, so it's just really that. Um, but now, you know, in high dimensions, here I assume that this sigma matrix was known in high dimensions. Uh, it, it, well, if it's not known, you have to estimate it, and then if you estimate it, it's not so clear. Uh, you can't just use the empirical covariance matrix because it cannot be inverted. So you have to do something. So that's why I put here a tilde here. So I'm going to use two choices or several choices for this estimator. Well, you can think of it as an estimator of the first column of the precision matrix. But actually what I want to show is that um, you should not really do that always. You should maybe do something else to obtain efficiency. But so far, it, in the in literature, oops, that's wrong, theta 1 was always considered as some estimator of the first column of the precision matrix. And here's the literature. Okay. Okay, this is what we just showed. Assume uh, this condition, then you have asymptotic normality with this asymptotic variance, theta 1, 1. Huh? That's the proof, we did that. Now the question is, what is the best possible asymptotic variance? What is the camera or lower bound? And then you just go back to, um, to your uh, lecture notes or uh, you look at uh, what is done in the finite dimensional case and you try to extend it to the infinite dimensional case. And that involves a little bit work because we're tr talking about uh, triangular arrays, so everything depends on the sample size. And uh, yeah, 
you have to be a little bit careful there. But this is how it goes. So you have a model for your parameter. In our case, it will be some kind of sparsity assumption. Um, then we're going to look in a certain direction, normalized by square root of n. Yeah, so square root of n comes from the asymptotic normality normalization. And we want this direction to stay inside the model class. We're not allowed to go outside the model class. And then you call an estimator t, which is actually a sequence of estimators, uh, regular, if, well, if your parameter is not beta 1, so beta 0 is here, say, fixed, but if the true parameter is not beta 0, but something close to it, so beta 0 plus something, a small perturbation, that then this estimator is still asymptotically normal with the same variance. Okay. So that means if your model is, so you have some beta zero, so fix some, some parameter. If, the, if this is not exactly the true parameter, but you're in a little small neighborhood, that, that you're still okay. Yeah, so this is saying that you, it goes beyond pointwise asymptotics. It's something like uniformly in a small neighborhood type of asymptotics. You want some unit uniformity in a neighborhood. And if you don't have that, you're killed also in practice, because then you will see in simulations that your asymptotic uh, di distributions do are not valid in finite sample sizes. Okay, so this is something to realize. It's, it's really a very necessary assumption that you want your estimates to be regular. It's something like unbiased or something like that, but for asymptotics. And so you're restricting, I'm going to restrict myself now to regular estimators because these are the ones which work well also in practice. Okay? You have to assume something, because otherwise you can always find get super efficiency and uh, so things like that. Okay, and then comes the camera lower bound. Suppose your estimator is asymptotically linear. That means uh, it's approximately, approximately an average with a term of smaller order. Yeah, so that's the 1 over square root of n from the central limit theorem. This is called the influence function. It has to mean, have to mean zero and finite variance. And I'm assuming this variance is also remaining finite. Yeah, so it's order 1 as n goes to infinity. And the Lindeberg condition to have the central limit theorem. And regularity of the estimator. Then you have this camera lower bound, the asymptotic variance is at least this maximal over, and important to note, it's the maximum over um, subdirections that stay within the model. Of, and it's, it's this quantity. Okay. And this is just, if you look more carefully, it's something like this. What's written there? Just. You're trying to do the regression of the first variable on all the others. But the, you have the coefficients have to be such that you stay within the model class. Okay, so if, if you have an estimator which has... Um, let's see, what do I write here? Which has an asymptotic variance which is exactly of that form for some direction within the model class, then you know it's efficient. Okay, so that's uh, a tool to prove its efficiency. Now let's look at an example. Suppose the model is that my underlying parameter is sparse, meaning that the number of non-zero coefficients is small, less than some value s. Uh, let s0 be the active set of the coefficients with size S0, so the S0 is smaller than S. Now, if the number of... Not, so if you have sparsity of the precision matrix, that's what this says, then, well, let's look here. Here it is. Here are these coefficients. Suppose it's sparse, in f in most of them are zero. Then this direction stays within the model class. And so you have efficiency. 
En dan zeg ik, de efficient variance is theta 1-1. Oké? Okay? So onder sparsity assumptions, this procedure gives you the efficient estimator. Uh, if you have that the first variable that we're trying to estimate is active and some beta min condition, you have to think a little bit. Uh, and if, in fact, uh, where is it? You're at the boundary, so to speak, of parameter space. Then the asymptotic, efficient asymptotic variance is the one, the same as the one where you know which variables are active. Okay? So that's, in, in a sense, bad news because it means that you will not be able to reach the camera or lower bound because you don't know which variables are active and you cannot mimic that, at least that's my conjecture. Of course, you can mimic it under additional assumptions, but if you have additional assumptions, you, you change your parameter space and the camera or bound also changes, so then you end in a loop, then you're cheating. Yeah, so this seems not very much something that can be achieved Although people do that, eh? what people do is they do the lasso, throw away the variables which are, uh, have coefficients equal to zero, and then refit, and then do, um, behave as if, as if they know the, act the active variables, and then just say, okay, I have uh, the asymptotic variance. But from, from this type of efficiency point of view, if you're honest, then that's not a good idea, that's not a good procedure. And more generally, if you, so this is just to point out a little bit that with this kind of sparsity assumptions, maybe this camera or lower bound is not achieved. As soon as you have non-sparsity, okay, here it's achieved maybe, but if, if this one is not sparse, then it's probably not achieved. Um, now let's assume we have a weaker form of sparsity that the L1 norm of the coefficients is bounded by something like square root s and that the true parameter stays away from the boundary that means the true parameter has is not exactly square root of s but a little bit smaller then uh, the camera lower bound is just minimizing this residual sum of squares so you try to project x1 on all the others but the coefficients have to be bounded by well, square root of s, and then there's a square root of n because of the normalization. Let me just go, go here, here. So the directions are normalized by square root of n, and that square root of n appears here as well. Okay, so you minimize this under an L1 restriction. Yeah, this is more like a lasso type of estimator than really projecting. This is really projecting. And here you're not doing the exact projection because you have an L1 norm restriction. Yeah, so if you want to improve over this factor, then we must have that the, the, the true projection, this gamma factor, or rather, or maybe this one, doesn't matter, is very non-sparse, so its L1 norm should be of larger order than square root of ns, because if it would be smaller order, you can just do the standard projection and it's okay. And so that's my idea, I want to show that if this thing is not sparse, uh, theta 1, 1 is not the camera or lower bound. Uh, yeah, exactly. And then this is in between, it gets a little bit technical, but it's, I think, interesting. So this is weak sparsity that you assume, oh, I should write it there. R is here a, a coefficient, just something fixed between zero and one, say one half. So this is uh, <coughs> generalizing those two cases. Here R is equal to one, here R is equal to zero, and here R is between zero and one. But if r is not zero, you get this bound. So again, you have to assume <coughs> to restrict yourself. You try to project, but you have to restrict yourself to, um, I should put here an r probably. I think there's a mistake here. Vectors with this r norm, I should put here an r, sorry, r, r. S vectors satisfying this condition. Okay. Uh, 
uh, yeah, finally, let's go to um, some another notation. Uh, if you have a sequence of random variables, I want to show and which distribution depends on parameters. I want to show that something is true uniformly in the parameter, because if you want to construct confidence intervals, you need that, right? It's not just for one parameter, but for all of them. So there's a soup outside the probability. Okay. So gamma zero is the projection of x1 on all the others. And that's just, you, this is the formula for projection. Standard formula, eh? x transpose x inverse x transpose y, but now in a disguised form because it's different notation. So this is x transpose x inverse, but now it's just all the other variables transpose and so on. So with a minus one, you don't take the first variable here. Okay. Now let's start with sigma known now. Um, so I'm going to assume that we have an el eligible pair that is, so to speak, gamma zero is the thing which is, say, not sparse, the true projection, and I'm going to approximate it by something which is sparse in this sense, in the L1 sense. Lambda sharp is here something small, depends on the situation, and gamma sharp is something, non -spar uh, something sparse, and uh, yeah, that if, if this is true simultaneously, we call this pair an eligible pair. And for such pair, we can sort of mimic the first col column of the precision matrix, like here. You take one and minus gamma, but now the sparse approximation, and divide by the residual sum of squares, but now something like a sparse version of that. So here's the residual sum of squares. Yeah, so this is just <coughs> x1 minus this one. It's x1 squared expectation of that is equal to 1. That's this 1 and minus this other quadratic term. Okay, it's written in there. So it's, it's similar as, as there here. Okay, now I'm, I'm going to do sample splitting. That's um, just to avoid uh, unnecessary conditions and to make the proof simple. You can do it without sample splitting, but then it's like in a paper by Mont Mont Montanari, you need additional technical assumptions. So let's just as an existence proof do it with sample splitting. Split the sample in two. On the first half, you, you take your uh, lasso estimator, for instance. And then let's see, so here is the first half, you do the lasso, and on the second half you use um, this uh, x and y variables. And then you reverse the roles, you do on the first half the x and y variables, and on the second half the lasso estimator. So then you have two debiased estimators, like I've written, was written here, and then I average them. And then you have the following result. Suppose these lasso estimators are consistent in prediction error, so to speak, and a quick enough rate for the L1 norm. Then you have asymptotic linearity uniformly in the underlying parameter and uh, asymptotic normality. And now I forgot the square root here, but the asymptotic variance is now this theta sharp and not theta 1 1 and so the asymptotic variance is now potentially smaller than theta 1 1 and so if you look at this condition there's nothing that prevents you from taking lambda sharp equal to zero if you look at the distribution if you take lambda sharp equal to zero you just take gamma sharp equal to gamma zero and then let's see uh, then this is automatically true, just, it's just zero. And then theta sharp is theta one one. And so that's a special case. You see there are no conditions then anymore on the L1 norm. You don't need this condition. You, you need to take something that tends to zero, right? Uh, uh, sorry? Lambda. No. Perhaps, uh, lambda sharp, I just take it to... Lambda sharp equals to zero. Uh -huh. I can take it, you, you, you're allowed to take it equal to zero. 
and then you get black back the, the result by Montanari. But now I'm, of course, interested where it's not going to zero, but it's maybe very small. And then uh, you may improve over the result by uh, Montanari by getting a better uh, asymptotic variance. Uh, so, um, so under the conditions of this theorem, you see here, this is asymptotic linearity. Uh, this is just linear in, the, in these variables. So it's asymptotically linear and regular. And so it means that the kramer rao lower bound applies. This is falls within the class for which the kramer rao lower bound holds. So if I can show for this estimator mm, that this variance is smaller, okay, if this is the... Yeah, I want to show now that this is the asymptotic variance, the efficient asymptotic variance. So let's look at an example. Suppose you have L0 sparsity, so the number of non-zero coefficients is bounded by S, and S is this usual condition, that S is of small order N over log P, that's the usual sparsity condition. Then you get this rate of convergence for the prediction error, so this goes to zero eh, by assumption, and this rate of convergence for the L1 error, that's standard literature theory, and then you want this time square root and lambda sharp to go to zero, so you want, uh, yeah, so there is a square root n here, it cancels, and this is the condition on lambda sharp. Okay, if you have L1 sparsity, then again the sparsity should be of this standard form, that should not be too large. If you have only L1 sparsity, you get consistency, but no rates, so-called slow rates, and here maybe not, so you need really strong assumptions on lambda sharp. And uh, if this gamma sharp, so this sparse approximation of gamma zero, the true projection, is sufficiently sparse, we see that the camera raro lower bound is achieved, and it's better than the one there, better than theta one one, if the true projection coefficients are very non-sparse, so in L1 norm larger than square root in S. Oh, and you can extend it to um, zero, one, and this is b R between zero and one. So here's a little table. It's so all for known uh, sigma, so this is L0 sparsity, L1 sparsity. The conditions on the S are the usual conditions. And the conditions on, on the, this lambda sharp are like this. And this is always by assumption true for an eligible pair. You always have, if, you, if this is true, you have asymptotic normality. And if this is true, you have asymptotic efficiency. Okay, where in this case asymptotic efficiency is with some, co well, not really, because this assumption depends on constants of the model class and uh, also on the, here the, here the assumptions actually depend on the true beta zero, and here I only need to assume that the true beta zero stays away from the boundary. So this is a very natural situation. This situation is not so nice. <coughs> If you look more carefully, you see that it sort of fits. Uh, the condition on uh, the sparsity of the sparse approximation of the projection is of order S here. And it's, uh, this S is this S. There's only a log term here. And here there's no log term gap. Here you see square root and S, square root and S. There's no log gap. So they, they come back. And if you look at where is it? R between zero and S, it's the same. Eh? So what you see here is conditions on lambda sharp, and they are the same here. F these conditions, there's no log, there's a log gap between asymptotic normality and asymptotic efficiency. So for asymptotic efficiency, you lead, need a little bit more, but what you need more is only logarithmic. It's only this log term, which is um, not here. Uh, yes. Okay. Now, 
I don't think I have very much time, so um, just quickly. What is this sparse approximation of this projection? So if the projection itself is not sparse, we do a sparse approximation. And the case we consider is where um, you have a sparse vector and the true projection is uh, like a, a least squares version of the sparse one. So if you do, if you have a sparse regression model and you do least squares without any assumptions, then the estimator will not be sparse. And this is sort of what I'm having here. So the gamma sharp is sparse. I do a projection, more or less. I can give the details. And then I get an unrestricted least squares type of projection. And then this is my gamma zero. And this one will then not be sparse. So if this is true, and this error term has some variance which doesn't go to zero, then the um, theta one one will be much larger, or at least the difference between the two will stay, stay away from zero. So you have an asymptotically non-vanishing improvement over theta one one. <coughs> so just this is saying I, I have examples, namely these type of pairs, which I call eligible. For these examples, I have an improvement over theta one one. No, I, I don't have a general result that you, what you can do. <coughs> so here's uh, some, some work. This is too technical for the, for the late hour. So if you do some uh, calculations, you get an improvement over theta 1, 1. But then this uh, true gamma zero, the true projection, has to be non-sparse. Uh, okay, if the, if, if the covariance matrix is unknown, we do something which everybody already does, that's doing the uh, lasso. Uh, so um, the gamma zero is the projection, coefficients of the projection of x1 on all the others, in theoretical sense. If you don't know, uh, if you can't compute it because you don't know sigma, you, do, you replace sigma by sigma hat. So you just do the projection of the first uh, column of x on all the other columns and then you use the lasso because if you just do straightforward projections because of the high dimensionality one variable is always a linear combination of all the others because and then you get just the projection it doesn't bring anything so then there's no residual so you have to do uh, regularization so for instance the lasso let's, let's do it so then you get an gamma hat, and then as a de-biased estimator, let's maybe go back. Where is it? Here. So here you have your freedom. Eh? So we now, this is the general notation. We now, with a known sigma, we replace this by theta sharp. With unknown sigma, we replace this by sigma hat, and sigma hat is the lasso. Yeah, so we get this. That's the, what people do in practice. Because in practice the, the covariance matrix is of course not known. Uh, okay, that's what we do here. Okay? So you have theta one hat, like there, one minus gamma hat, the lasso, divided by the residual sum of squares, and plus this, this is quite natural if you look at the, at the, at the formulas. I, I, I won't explain it here. But this is more or less the residual sum of squares like there, but now for the lasso. Uh, okay, so this is the de-biased estimator with here the lasso now. Assume this condition, which is also here, 1 over log p. Uh, consider an eligible pair, some technical conditions. Then you get uh, asymptotic, well, not there's, there's a little point here. You get this expansion with a remainder term which is of small order. This expansion is not, uh, does not give you asymptotic linearity because this is a random thing. So this is not a linear function. 
This is not an average, this is something with a random part. So, but you still, by Slutsky's theorem, you get uh, asymptotic normality and you get the asymptotic variance is theta 1, 1 sharp. Okay, so this is something depending on what you want. I mean, our camera lower bound is assuming that the estimator you're considering is asymptotically linear. So if we want to say something about asymptotic efficiency here, we have to have uh, strengthens the assumptions so that we can have asymptotic linearity. Yeah, so that's what this says. If you assume that your lasso estimator of gamma is converging fast enough, 1 over square root log p, then you have asymptotic linearity, and then you can say, okay, the camera lower bound applies. Huh? So if, if I wrote this kind of assumption in a paper and then the referee says, well, it's something similar, the referee says, you don't need that assumption because blah, blah, blah. Stutsky's theorem is a yeah, but I'm trying to prove asymptotic linearity and there I need this assumption. Yeah, so that's a little discussion, well, wh why would you want li asymptotic linearity? Well, that's for that kind of situation, I have my Kramer Rao lower bound and I don't, otherwise I don't know what to do. Okay, so I'm running out of time, so let me just give you the table. So this is for unknown sigma, and for unknown sigma, you need this sparsity assumption, for instance, if you have L0 sparsity, square root, log, square root n over log p. So again, this assumption, um, my referee said, you don't need that assumption, look at the papers of Montanari, but um, this assumption is a necessary assumption, almost, there's a big O, I think, here, if you want to prove uh, asymptotically unbiasedness of your estimator, so there's no way. This is virtually a necessary assumption for asymptotic unbiasedness. And so as soon as you start thinking statistically, not pointwise, but uniformly, you need such kind of conditions for the case sigma unknown. If it's known, no, but if it's unknown, yes, you do need this condition. Okay, then the, 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 the other rates, and you see again something for asymptotic normality, asymptotic linearity, now you need to assume additional things, and asymptotic efficiency, you need to stay within the parameter space, so that's this kind of assumptions. If sigma is unknown, I have to assume that my sparsity description, the weak sparsity is really for r less than 1, for r equal to 1, you don't get anything anymore. You can see it happening here. Mm, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? So if r is equal to 1, you get here that s should be of order 1 over log p. So the, that makes no sense. Okay? It's just not good enough. So L1 sparsity is, of course, a very weak form of sparsity. You would like to assume only that, but it doesn't work in this case. So I assume R less than 1 and then um, asymptotic normality, linearity and efficiency, they have these conditions. And if you compare these two, they're not even, uh, one is not a subset of the others, it gets a little bit messy there. Okay, let me see. Mm. Yeah, just very quickly some simulations. These are done by uh, Francesco Ortelli just so that it really shows up in the simulations. So here the theta 1, 1 is 5, and the theta 1, 1 sharp is 1, and um, the first parameter is equal to 1, and the number of unknown parameters, uh, sorry, the number of active parameters is varying. Okay, so you see that at least if you have more active variables, <coughs> it, the difference doesn't show in the beginning, but for a larger sample size, indeed see that the asymptotic variance is smaller than the five that you would get if you would use that procedure there. And if the troop underlying parameter is, is not active, well, you do the lasso eh, as an issue for estimator. So you, you're sort of um, profiting for that, and then you see that the, there is no uh, starting here. So the asymptotic variance is always already quite good. 
according to the theory. So it's, it's one, and you see its asymptotic variance is <coughs> already quite clear, close to that. OK. Thank you very much. Thank you. It is a standard thing in this kind of theory because you see you have some um, maybe it's written here somewhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you look at this here. So you just have some something uh, something um, I don't know. Yeah, no, I should maybe write it some. Um, yeah. Yeah. Look at this kind of expression. If this would be a fixed vector, not a random vector, you just have a linear combination mm -hmm. of. So you have. You just have an average, and you know how it behaves. One over square root of n. An average behaves like one over square root of n. But now you have here random coefficients, and then the trick is, of course, okay, I take one from another set so that they're random but independent of what's going on here, and then I can just condition on it, and so as if it's not random, and then you just have uh, averages. But because of the sample size splitting, you split it in half, so you would say, okay, I lose half of the sample, that's why I do it, swap it, and average again not to lose uh, <laughs> efficiency there, like the factor one half suddenly in the variant would not be a good idea. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, more questions? Uh, maybe I will ask you. Uh, is anything like this possible in the case when you estimate not just, just one coordinate in the same basis in which uh, you have sparsity, but uh, say a linear function of the linear form of the parameter. Yeah, but you, the, the depends on the coefficients of the linear form. If it's sparse, you, you're fine. But otherwise, um, mm -mm. otherwise you're, you're in trouble. Fine, yeah. You're not fine. <laughs> okay, more questions? Okay, well, let's thanks, Sarah, for all. Thank you. Lecture. Thank you very much.